Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today for today's uh, Science Community Zoom here at Green Bank Observatory. My name is Paul Vostein, and I'll be your Zoom host for the day. Um, things are a little crazy out here at Green Bank right now. We have our AUI Visiting Committee here in place, uh, and so most of our folks, are, including our director, are busy with presentations and talking with them. So the news from Green Bank is wheels are being put on the, the uh, observatory telescope, the GBT, and uh, it's pretty cloudy right now, but observations are going on in the evenings and on weekends. I'd like to turn things over to our speaker for today. We have Alexander McEwen from the University of Baltimore, Maryland County. He'll be talking on the Green Bank 820 megahertz pulsar survey, discoveries and follow-up. So Alexander, the show is yours. Awesome, thank you. All right, yeah, so First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so I'm Alex, as as mentioned. Uh, I'm at UMBC now doing uh, x-ray things uh, in my research, but my PhD focused on radio stuff, and I did lots of work using uh, data from Green Bank, and in particular, uh, this Green Bank 820 megahertz pulsar survey. So I have a, a link there. Uh, if anybody's interested in, in looking at the paper um, on ADS, welcome to scan that link or reach out to me either way. So I'll go over a few uh, just basics of, of pulsar physics and, and our observations of them. Uh, and then I'll go into more specifics about this survey and, and the discoveries we made. Um, so first, pulsar basics. So pulsars are, are neutron stars. These are incredibly dense cores that are left behind when massive stars go through their supernova phase. Um, so they leave behind these very dense, very small, uh, relatively about 10 kilometer uh, radius stars uh, left behind. Because they're so much smaller than their predecessors uh, and they conserve the angular momentum of those predecessors, uh, they typically are born, born, born with rotation periods of about a few hundred uh, milliseconds. Um, their magnetic field is also quite strong um, as they've been compressed down and reaches up to upwards of 10 to the 12 Gauss, which is some of the most magnetic objects uh, in the universe that we know of. So that magnetic field actually produces uh, dipole radiation, basically accelerating particles away from the neutron star and sapping that rotation energy. Uh, and because of that, the pulsar will actually slow down as it ages. Um, and that emitted energy goes into uh, powering their surrounding nebula. So we get these very beautiful images of pulsar nebulae, uh, like you see on the, on the right here. And additionally, about 10% of the pulsars that we know of are in binary orbit. So they have a companion star that they, that they orbit around. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. So as these pulsars spin, their magnetic fields actually beam radio emission from their poles. And when that beam of radiation passes over Earth, uh, our telescopes will detect this very faint pulse, hence the name. So as those pulses come in, we need to correct for a few effects due to uh, their traveling through the, grab the, through the galaxy, not to the telescope. And we also need to basically add together a whole bunch of individual pulses to create a, a bright uh, pulse profile. So once we have that pulse profile, we can reference the time of its peak to a clock on Earth to get uh, sort of the foundational or fundamental component of pulsar research, which is the time of arrival. So the time that the pulse arrived at the telescope. Now with that measured quantity, we take our model, which will predict when that pulse should arrive, and we can compare them by literally subtracting them, taking a difference between when the pulse arrived and what we expect it to. When we have a good model, that uh, resulting residual is what it's called, should be scattered around zero. Basically, our model is predicting these pulses arrival well. Um, in cases where we have errors in our models, uh, those errors will show up in those residuals as these sort of systematic trends um, that we can use to tune those models. So we get very precise measurements of things like the pulsar spin, as well as its position and motion in the sky. Um, so we have these all throughout our galaxy, sort of like a, a mesh of clocks that we can track time in the pulsar's, pulsar's frame. So I mentioned binary pulsars earlier, uh, and these are very useful scientifically systems. Um, so 
in particular, uh, making measurements of pulsar mass is very important for understanding how pulsars evolve, how pulsars are born, uh, just how how matter acts at these very high densities, um, and other sort of just stellar physics. But making measurements of those masses are are really quite difficult. And in fact, for for pulsars that are isolated that do not are not in binaries, it's almost impossible. Um, but when a pulsar is orbiting a companion star, uh, that additional motion will imprint itself on those residuals that I showed on the last on the last slide. And so we can actually use that information to learn about the binary shape and, and some things about the companion. Um, so while we can get some information from that binary motion as it is, um, only special systems where you have uh, relativistic effects that start to become important uh, can we make actual measurements of the pulsar mass directly. Um, so these are uniquely special systems that uh, give rise to these uh, very subtle effects. Um, when you have a system like the one I'm showing on the right here, so this is actually a, a plot that's showing uh, details about a system of two pulsars that are orbiting each other. You can actually make very precise measurements of multiple uh, of these so-called post-Keplerian parameters and use those to uh, basically test your theory of gravity, to test how, how well these independent measurements agree with one another. So this system, uh, double pulsar system, is, is one, of the, one of the most important systems uh, in, in pulsar science. So beyond uh, binary motion, you know, uh, as these pulsars are emitting their radio waves and those radio waves pass through our galaxy, it interacts with the material in our galaxy, which also will affect how those pulses look when they arrive at Earth. So there are a number of effects that are significant in pulsar, uh, pulsar astronomy. Um, the three I mentioned here are dispersion, scattering, and scintillation. So dispersion is shown on the left, where you see uh, the pulse emission is sweeps down toward lower frequency, basically lower frequency parts of the pulse will arrive later. Um, and accounting for that, adjusting, basically shifting over that lower frequency part tells us something about the material along the line of sight. Similarly, uh, scattering and scintillation have to do with uh, the emission interacting with that material um, and sort of combining uh, incoherently at earth and refracting and scattering in time. Uh, so we get pulses that are emitted very sharply become spread out in time. So all this allows us to sort of probe the galaxy uh, along the lines of sight to these pulsars. On uh, the millisecond pulsar side, so these are the fastest spinning pulsars um, that we know of, uh, we've actually been able to use their very precise rotation to measure an incredibly subtle effect due to uh, a universe full of gravitational wave emitting supermassive black holes. So this is a very important uh, milestone in gravitation and, and pulsar physics. Uh, this, these results, Nanograv was one member of the International Pulsar Timing Array uh, that published these results last summer. So now I'll go into my work on the survey, uh, the GBT-820 survey or Cygnus survey. Uh, so this survey, as the name suggests, uh, peers through the Cygnus X region. Um, this plot or little image down here in the bottom left shows this is peering through three arms of the galaxy. So there's a lot of material along this line of sight. And that has been studied um, in many other studies uh, other than pulsar research. There are lots of massive stars here, lots of dust and material uh, to suggest very active star formation and evolution. Um, despite this, at the time of the GBT 820s conception, um, there hadn't really been done, there hadn't really been many pulsar searches done in this region. And those that had been were largely at lower frequencies where these effects like dispersion um, and scattering can become very significant and, and basically make it impossible to detect pulsars. So the 820 survey was designed to help with that. And uh, after about two thirds of the survey was observed, um, we studied those data and we discovered six new pulsars. So show those profiles up here on the, on the right side with their names. 
Uh, and then I show them uh, in the survey region alongside other known pulsars, um, the, the, the stars there. So one of those sources in particular, uh, 2035 plus 3655, was of particular interest um, upon discovery because of its spin period. So it was spinning at a rate of about 24, or a period of about 24 milliseconds, which uh, in our sort of canonical period versus period derivative uh, plot down here, uh, where this red line is the 24 millisecond mark, that actually places this pulsar alongside a lot of very interesting systems where pulsars are orbiting particularly massive companions, um, specifically the so-called intermediate mass binary pulsars. These are very massive white dwarves, um, but also double neutron star systems. So like that last, like that double pulsar I talked about earlier. So these systems are very important and they're very exciting. So this prompted a, a follow-up proposal at GBT for the following spring. Um, that proposal was intended to test to see if we could confirm this binary, whether it's in a binary, and also to improve our position, uh, so reduce the error bars on our position. Um, so we achieved both goals. We, we measured a significant change in the pulsar period over a, a relatively short time frame. Um, but we also used this on-the-fly mapping technique where we basically drift over the pulsar's uh, discovery position and see where it shows up most brightly uh, to get a better position. So we achieved both these goals, and that prompted a, a further proposal to nail down this binary solution. So we observed the pulsar for a total of 12 hours, split into three observations, um, and we determined quite precisely that this pulsar's binary system took about four and a half hours to orbit, and its companion was likely around one solar mass. Um, additionally, we could tell uh, that the orbit was fairly circular, so it was very low eccentricity. And those that uh, predicted mass and eccentricity suggest that it's more likely to be a massive white dwarf than a neutron star. But we don't know for sure because, uh, you know, the uncertainties are still somewhat large on those values. So what we tried to do is to use our data to make a measurement of one of those post-Keplerian parameters, namely the so-called Shapiro delay. So this is a relativistic effect that comes up when uh, the companion star basically passes in front of the pulsar relative to the telescope. And we see an additional delay in the arrival of those pulses as they travel through the gravitational well of their companion. So this plot down here, this is not of 2035. This is a, a different source where the Shapiro delay signal is detected very brightly. So you can see this, this cuspy point here as those, those pulses are delayed. We tried to measure this signal in our data, which are much noisier than these data. And uh, I'm showing a sort of contour map of that, that fit over here, where you can see we have a region, this dark region, is the region of best support for this model. So it is not at zero, which is good. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's definitely a, a region where we have a possible detection of these parameters, but it's really quite a, quite a faint detection. It's about two sigma, two times the noise, which really isn't enough to say definitively what this companion is. So uh, these are the actual residuals um, to sort of compare with that last plot where you can see, obviously we have a lot more noise and scatter, um, but I'm showing the our model for the Shapiro delay under those, um, you know, draw your own conclusions, whether that counts as a detection. Uh, but in order to improve this detection, we really need to get better TOA uncertainties. And from doing lots of simulations, unfortunately it seems like that uh, to actually do that observationally would take a really long time with, with the GBT or even with many other instruments we were considering. So uh, on the order of 15 orbits or so, which at four and a half hours per orbit is, is quite a big ask um, for, a, for a, a potential non-detection. So we're looking at other ways to, to make, this, make this detection. Aside from 2038, um, we also examined uh, this scattering phenomenon um, for nine pulsars, including two of our discoveries, we had detections of these sources, both in our survey and at other frequencies. 
And with that, we can basically compare the pulse profiles at uh, both frequencies and see how much they spread out at lower frequencies. So you can see that in these images where the higher frequency observation is more pointed than the lower frequency observation. By actually quantifying this spread, basically as an amount of time that it is spread out in, um, we can plot that, plot those values in context with other scattering measurements that have been made for pulsars, as well as sort of some model predictions. And we see that at the lower, at the lower dispersion measure, so for the closer pulsars, we find that scattering is actually, you know, sort of on the upper edge of what predictions and ob previous observations have shown. So the spread in these measurements is obviously quite large, uh, but this is still potentially interesting. You know, we're seeing significant scattering for these sources. Another way to sort of compare our detections to the population is through um, simulated populations. So we use this code called PSR Poppy. Um, I have a link up here in the, in the corner if anybody's interested. And what this code does is it basically takes results from a number of surveys and produces a population of pulsars that will match those results. So we did that, we produce a population, and then we took the pulsars that are in our survey region and we compare their parameters to the parameters of our actual detections and discoveries. So the black lines in these two plots over here show the uh, simulations. The green is the detected sources, and the red are other sources in the region that we did not detect. So we noticed some discrepancies. Um, in period, the discrepancy was somewhat small. Um, basically, the simulations predict slightly longer periods for the detections that we would get from the survey, um, though this discrepancy is, is not that significant. Much more interesting is the discrepancy in dispersion measure, where we see that simulations predict um, basically a, a much, much lower DM sources along this line of sight. In fact, the median value of our actual detections is somewhere close to the 90%, where we should have detected 90% of sources according to our, uh, our, our simulations. So this tells us that simulations are greatly under predicting dispersion measure along this line of sight. So again, dispersion measure tells us about stuff along the line of sight. So more evidence that there's sort of an over density here. So finally, to sort of pull that stuff together, uh, we looked at the sensitivity of the survey. So this how well it, it's done what it was trying to do. Um, and what we're plotting here is the flux density, sort of the brightness of the pulsar in our radio observations at 820 megahertz against the spin period. And the circles are detections, squares are sources that we did not detect, but were detected using the FAST telescope in China, which is very large. Um, and these curves indicate sort of the minimum detectable uh, brightness for a given period. And you can see, we uh, have a sort of a fundamental lower limit of around a tenth of a millijansky, which is quite good at the time of the survey. And prior to FAST, this was the most sensitive search in this region. The fact that there are a number of sources down here that FAST has detected suggests that, you know, sort of in line with those last, that last slide, there may be many high DM sources still that simulations don't expect here, but there may still be in the region that can be, be discovered. So finally, in summary, uh, 820 survey has done a, a great job. We've detected 60 pulsars, including this interesting uh, binary source. And we've also uncovered that, you know, there's certainly some discrepancy in the amount of material in this region. Um, so that can help us with future modeling of pulsar populations, as well as other survey, uh, survey things. So that's the end of my talk, and I'll take questions. Thank you very much, Alex, for a very interesting talk. Um, interesting topic, indeed. And mm -hmm. I would remind folks, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to ask your questions. And we already have a question there. Uh, this one is, any idea of the distance to PSR J2035 and point uh, 3655, any hope of detecting the companion at other wavelengths? I guess you need a better determination of the position of the pulsar. Could it be done with the VLA, since you're wearing that shirt? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so the fact that this, this source's dispersion measure is 137 parsecs per cubic centimeter, which um, looking at the distribution of dispersion measures that we 
detect in our in our survey is actually on the low end. So that means it's probably more likely to be a, a closer source rather than farther away. There are some estimates, there are models that will estimate, you know, actual physical distance depending on dispersion measure. And for this source, I believe it predicted something along the line of, you know, a, a, a few kiloparsecs, though those models are actually, you know, the same models that are used for these population estimates. So, you know, there may be, uh, it may be quite, you know, sort of miscalculating basically. Um, we did look for this, for this binary uh, in optical wavelengths to see if we could see anything. This was sort of before we had really uh, determined what uh, the companion was likely to be, and we didn't see anything in any of the in any of the observations that we had had looked at. So um, the position at this point is actually fairly well known. Um, radio pulsar timing is is actually really really good at at nailing down very precise positions. So I don't think the position would be an issue, but um, at this point, you know, if it's a car, if it's a white dwarf or a neutron star, those are both really fairly faint objects. Um, so they would be hard to detect in, in optical surveys. Um, as far as the VLA, yeah, I think that would might help us get a position uh, better, but I don't think we would necessarily need that to be able to say whether or not there's a, a detectable source here other than this pulsar. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Okay, we have another question here. Are the lower Milijansky pulsars due to inherent beam alignment or are they just farther away? That's another great question. I, I assume you probably mean uh, these sources. So it may, be, I think in some cases it is because they're farther away. You see, you know, um, these, these sources are, even though they are sort of on the darker end of the dispersion measure, uh, they're still very faint. And um, some of the sources that have been detected are at very large dispersion measures. Um, so even if they're relatively bright, there's a lot of material between us and them. And that material will interact with uh, the radio light as it gets to us and makes it harder for them to be detected. Um, FAST, the, the telescope that I'm comparing to here, is a really, it's a huge telescope. It's, FAST literally stands for 500 uh, meter aperture uh, spherical telescope. So it's a, a giant telescope, which means that there's a lot of, it can, it can pick up very, very faint signals, um, very, very faint pulsars. So it does a particularly good job in the, in the range of the sky that it has visibility uh, to, which includes this, this survey region. Um, so we tried to, we did try to detect these sources using uh, our survey data after we had seen their uh, they're published, you know, periods and positions and things like that, and we just weren't able to in our in our observations. Perhaps if our if our survey observations were longer, we might be able to do that. But um, that would yeah, that would require more more time on the telescope, obviously. Got another question here. Do you rule out that the J twenty thirty five companion is not a main sequence star? We. We do mostly because of the optical search that I mentioned earlier. So um, main sequence stars, especially for a source that's you know relatively close by along this line of sight, would be should be detectable um, in optical. So yeah, the, I think we would have seen it if if it was a main sequence star. That's a good question, though. Another question here: Could the uh, square kilometer array have better detection sensitivity than fast? That is, that's a good question. Um, so, and I can tell you that we actually just looked at a number of uh, different telescope configurations for that source specifically um, for the last proposal cycle, because we we're hoping to determine where we should observe basically. Um, and the square kilometer array was among those. And I believe that it was slightly more sensitive, um, but it's still, it still wasn't sensitive enough to to make the detection in a reasonable amount of time. Um, yeah. Okay. Another question, kind of related, uh, would such searches be more efficient at higher frequencies with a multi-pixel instrument? Uh, another good question. So, in some ways, yes, um, but there is there is sort of a a, a trade-off. So, 
Typically, pulsars are, so for one, I'll say there had been surveys uh, at high frequencies, and many of those surveys have done very well and produced uh, a lot of pulsars. Um, but there is a trade-off. Um, so pulsars are typically brighter at lower frequencies. Um, that's not always the case, but typically. And uh, But also the, the sky background is also brighter at lower frequencies. So while... Um, as you move to higher frequency, the sky becomes sort of less bright, meaning you have less background, um, but the, the pulsars also get fainter. And in some cases, the pulsars actually get fainter faster than the background. So that means they'll drop below your sensitivity limit as you go to higher frequencies. Um, another complication, uh, strictly at, at um, 1400 megahertz, which is a commonly used higher frequency for radio surveys, uh, it's a an annoyingly RFI uh, ridden band. So RFI is radio frequency interference. Um, so this is just terrestrial signals like, you know, TV and, and radio and stuff like that on Earth that uh, is used can, can actually and has continued to become more of a problem over time. Um, basically, we lose data because of interference from those other sources. So that's another trade-off. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, an, uh, for this region though, I mean, especially because the dispersion measure uh, is so large for the sources along the line of sight, I think that uh, a higher frequency observations could definitely be useful. Um, and I mean, FAST does observe at, at a higher frequency, which may, you know, be another reason why some of these sources are detected there um, in, their, in their searches. Um, but perhaps a, perhaps a deep, survey of this region at, at L band or something would be, would be a good, a good choice. Okay. We have two more questions. I think that's all we're going to have time for. And the first question is why are low DM seen towards a small spin period? Why? Uh, I'm sorry. Why are low DMs? What? Seen towards a small oh. spin period. Yeah. So that's, a, that's another great question. So it's not actually this, so this is actually a selection effect. So um, basically, as you know, so talking back, looking back at the uh, scattering and, and things. So when you have, you imagine, so this is one rotation of the pulse of a pulsar. And um, whether, you know, for this plot, you don't necessarily know what the period, how long it takes for that pulsar to rotate is. But, um, you know, if you have a really fast pulsar, so in other words, a, a, a short spin period, low spin period, this whole uh, pulse might occur over, you know, a few milliseconds. And so if you have a source that is, you know, rotating that quickly, and then also you have a high dispersion measure, which results in the pulse being spread out, um, you know, our scattering time scales are typically on the order of, of you know, microseconds to milliseconds. And so you can actually, you know, basically completely lose your pulse. You know, if this scattering basically is longer than the pulse itself, then, you know, that pulse is basically not detectable. Um, so for that reason, you know, we're really only sensitive to short period pulsars that are fairly close by, especially at, at lower radio frequencies. Um, so, yeah, that's a great question. Okay, do you think the uh, greater dispersion measure is due to greater electron density in the Cygnus direction? Yeah, exactly. Um, so the dispersion comes from uh, basically the radio light interfering with, with electrons along the line of sight. So um, this region is known to be a fairly dusty uh, and, and sort of gaseous region, meaning that there are a lot of, you know, sort of free electrons in the, in, along these lines of sight. Um, but that seems to be, you know, particularly significant here. Basically, there, there, this material is 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 very uh, almost opaque in radio, right? It's blocking a lot of this light. And in fact, um, there have been a couple of I, this isn't in, in the talk, but there have been a couple of pulsars that have been observed in this region that have uh, basically distance measurements from. Uh, like supernovae that they're in. So they actually have like a, a fairly precise measurement of their distance independent of their dispersion measure. And when comparing their measured 
distance to the distance that's predicted just using their dispersion measure, that real distance is actually much closer than what the dispersion measure is, is predicting. So in other words, the dispersion measure is quite high for how relatively close these sources are. So it may be that there's like a large amount of gas that's, you know, fairly close to us, but that is blocking a lot of the of the radio light from this from this region. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions today. Uh, however, if you want to pop up your uh, email address one more time, Alex, and the way folks can reach out to you oh, if they have a specific yeah, information. Yeah. And uh, I thank you all for joining us today. Please join us again next time for our next talk, which will actually be a presentation by Tony Beasley, the director of NRAO, as well as our own Jim Jackson, director here at Green Bank Observatory. And they will be speaking on uh, our future here at Green Bank Observatory, basically with our reintegration back in with NRAO.